Okay, I guess I'll just start. So yeah, hi, my name is Morris. Um, I'm a software engineer at uh, Coplay Software. Um, we do compilers, profilers, debuggers, stuff like that. Um, so whenever you, if you're a chip vendor by any chance and want a compiler from us, uh, please come talk to me, I guess. Uh, so um, my talk, the name of my talk is bring compute to embedded hardware. And the, the problem I have is here is um, I, th I think I'm a bit of an outcast here because there are so many people who have a hardware or electrical engineer background um, and uh, I don't really deal with many of your problems. Like at least I have an operating system, I, I have virtual memory and so on. I have to, don't have to deal with the interesting humors by uh, the hardware vendors. Uh, so my realm here is everything on the right side of this red arrow here. Uh, so at least you can think of the stuff I do is everything past the Raspberry Pi and high up. I, I don't really work with a stone or an Arduino or, um, yeah. Uh, so um, I still do very low, low level kind of stuff. But, um, and uh, hardware related stuff, but at least, yeah, uh, I have an operating system. And um, one of the, uh, the thing I'd like to talk about is um, the developments of everything from here to there. And that's very interesting because um, if we look at current high end hardware in, uh, uh, in, in the embedded realm here, uh, we can see that, well, some uh, very expensive chips like the Zelling uh, Zinc Ultrascale processor, um, they do have um, Cortex-A CPU cores, they have another set of real-time CPU cores, they have a GPU and an FPGA all on the same die. Um, so first of all, can I have a quick survey? So who knows C++? Yeah, everyone, keep your hands up. Of those people here, who knows how to program FPGAs with Verilog VHDL or something? So there are two people left. Do you know any of the graphics APIs like OpenGL, CL? You do? Okay, so, oh, and you do. Okay, so in this room we have two people who are actually able to use all of the silicon that is available on this chip. And this is not uh, an exception here, this is getting increasingly common. So here's another example. Here's the Renaissance um, Arca V3M uh, SOC that has also an ARM Cortex um, A uh, CPU, another set of real-time processors, and their own accelerator device, uh, which is an image processor. Um, so it's a, special, it's a specialized hardware that can only program with, through OpenCL and C++ um, or through their vendor-specific APIs. Um, and what I learned last week is that Google also started to uh, move into that space and try uh, start shipping their own low power TPUs that you can only program through the TensorFlow API. So now we have a, diff uh, we have a huge set of libraries that, um, and APIs uh, that we need to um, program these devices. And this is not just uh, in the embedded space. Um, so for example, my laptop here uh, has, a Intel, uh, has an Intel chip uh, with a quad-core processor, um, AVX instruction set, so the theoretical peak performance, if I just add vectors in a loop over and over again and don't do anything with them, is about 166.4 uh, gigaflops. Um, so you should take those numbers with a huge grain of salt, but still. Um, just as a um, point of reference, the uh, GPU that is on this very same die has almost um, three times the performance of the CPU, and yet uh, with C++ we can't really access this compute power. Um, and I think that's very sad because uh, we're writing C++ we, because we're trying to get the most performance uh, out of our hardware, and yet we can only leverage like 40% out of this chip here. Um, so, um, I think the reason was uh, that 
GPGPU and all these accelerators were kind of niche until very recently. Um, and this is uh, because, um, well, up until say 2005 or so, 2006, we could just add transistors, we could maybe add some cores, um, we can add, make our SIMD yeah, units wider, um, and even that is coming to a stop very, um, slowly but steadily. Now we have to use more and more specialized hardware to get the performance we need. For example, um, look at the Google TPUs or the NVIDIA Tensor cores um, that have specialized hardware for low precision matrix multiplication, which you need for machine learning. Um, and uh, so up until 2000, maybe 2005, uh, you didn't really need to program a GPU unless you're a graphics programmer. Um, and this also showed itself in the API. So I don't know, can you read that? No, right. So this is the uh, boilerplate you need in OpenCL to just launch a kernel, add two vectors, and read it back in. So this is just the hello world of OpenCL. And really, if you, do, if you want to do this correctly, um, this is way too complicated for the average programmer to, um, to program in. Um, but yeah, this is slowly changing since uh, we don't even only have OpenCL, we have other libraries with other APIs. Uh, the most famous one being CUDA, we have, all, but we have also have uh, C++ AMP for Microsoft, and um, more HPC-like libraries like HPX. Uh, we also have OpenMP, uh, which gained the ability to offload to the um, GPU. Um, so also, um, GPUs are a lot more common now because now we can, I can just buy a Raspberry Pi for five or 10 euros and uh, yeah, it has a GPU, so why not use it? Um, and uh, we got modern C++, it's also very important. So we now have a more, very much more expressive way of writing our code. And this will very, come very, very handily, especially in the realm of GPUs, uh, which we'll see later on. So, before I continue, I'll just want to give a very quick introduction on how do GPUs even work, what are GPUs, um, and why are the program walls the way they are. So first of all, a bit of history. We always, we've always had basically specialized graphics hardware since the advent of gaming and arcade gaming. Uh, but it started to get more interesting in the end of the 1980s when we had uh, the first 3D um, GPUs and the first programmable 3D GPUs that could run small programs uh, per pixel or per, vert uh, per vertex. Um, so we, we finally had specialized parallel processes in, inside of our machines. And this, uh, a very important milestone was in 1992 when SGI uh, published uh, Open, OpenGL and gave it away to the industry uh, as an open standard. And this library was adopted by many other um, uh, companies, and this is why OpenGL is still around, and we can still compile the OpenGL we have written 25 years ago. And obviously, um, the GPUs work a lot different uh, today than they were 25 years ago, but the code still works. Um, and to steer the development of OpenGL and all the related technologies, uh, in 2000, uh, the Kronos Group was formed, which is a group of uh, industry um, uh, members uh, to have a more a vendor neutral way of developing uh, the standard and the technology forward. And one of the things they did uh, two years later, for example, is uh, create a standardized assembly language for writing shaders for your GPU. Up until then, you were forced to write, say, NVIDIA machine code or um, ATI machine code or something like that to run specialized shaders or custom shaders on your GPU or use OpenGL, which only provides a very fixed function set, so you couldn't run your own code on, on your GPU up until that point. Uh, at the same time, NVIDIA also went off and created their own language called CIFAR Graphics, uh, which is much more expressive than a fake assembly language. Um, and the Kronos Group and Microsoft um, catch up two years later with the introduction of DLSL and HLSL, uh, which are still very much graphics focused. But it was also this time, right, 2004 and 2006, when the first uh, research papers sh uh, popped up everywhere, saying, basically saying, 
okay, I just did matrix matrix multiplication on my GPU and it turned out to be faster than on my CPU. It was sort of at the point where GPUs start to get more interesting for the, the scientific computing world, for example. Um, so in 2006, we saw the first um, more general, uh, general GPGPU languages uh, arriving. Um, and this ended basically with, in 2007 with the introduction of NVIDIA's CUDA, which is their vendor-specific API um, of programming these, uh, their chips. The Kronos group followed one year later with OpenCL, which is a bit more lower level. Um, and it also comes with their own uh, C dialect. And yeah, in 2016, um, we more or less got rid of OpenGL uh, because OpenGL really did not reflect current GPU hardware anymore. So we, want, we just want to have a much lower level API. Uh, and this is exactly what Vulkan is. So the basic idea of a GPU is that we want to have throughput and not low latency processing. We assume that we have a big chunk of data that we need to process, and then we um, just throw a lot of cheap but small uh, processes on this problem. So a CPU does a lot of very smart things for us, like out of order execution, instruction level parallelism, and so on. The GPU doesn't really need this because we, the general assumption is, okay, if my pipeline is stalling for some reason, I just switch to something else. There will be something else that I can work on probably. Um, as long as your problem is well optimized for GPU, obviously. Um, so this is why GPUs, generally speaking, have a very high peak performance, but it's also very hard to get good performance out of them um, because they are, these chips are a lot more dumber than your CPU is. So here's a basic overview of, well, how your computer works. Um, we have a CPU. Um, which, is, uh, which contains our host code. Um, the CPU is connected to our main memory or RAM, uh, and the GPU is just a co-processor co of uh, our CPU. And the GPU also contains, it has its own memory. And the thing is, we can't generally assume that the CPU and the GPU memory are the same. So they might be disconnected. This is as well the case in the desktop computers with the add-in graphics cards, for example, that have their own G um, video memory. So if we want to program these devices, first, what we need to do first is we need to allocate our memory um, on the GPU side before we can do any calculations. And then, um, yeah, we transfer the data, we copy the kernel, uh, launch the kernel on the GPU, the GPU writes the data back to the buffer that has been allocated, and then we can move uh, the data back to the CPU. So you, we have, need to have an explicit control of how we copy our data back and forth. So if we take a closer look at GPUs, um, GPUs also have a memory hierarchy. That is slightly different from, from CPUs, though. So I'm, I'm also introducing OpenCL terms here now. So uh, a GPU is usually connected to global memory, and the global memory um, is usually connected via bus. So global memory usually maps to the GDDR memory you have on your um, add-in cards, um, and it's sure surrounding your graphics chip, basically. Um, a GPU is m usually organized in a set of compute units, which can act kind of independent from, uh, from each other, and all the compute units also have their local memory, which is um, most likely on chip or, yeah much closer to the actual uh, computation hardware. So it's much faster than global memory. In the side of the compute units, we have our processing elements, which also contain their private memory. So here's our memory hierarchy. We have global memory, we have local memory, we have private memory. Um, another thing that we do usually in, in GPU computing is we employ this um, idiom of SPMD code which stands for single program multiple data. So we just assume in our program that we are just processing a single element, and then we basically duplicate this problem and run it a thousand times. Uh, and this is in contrast to, say, regular C++ where you just wrap everything in a for loop. Um, when you launch the kernel, 
finally, with your SPMD kernel, you also need to specify your iteration space. So it doesn't really make any sense to, to refer to, uh, say, pointers and, and ranges and so on. We, we'd rather have something like a big iterator space um, that can be an OpenGL, uh, an OpenCL, or CUDA one, two, or three dimensional. So I can create a cube of my um, iteration space, and then for each of these processing elements, um, we um, uh, we yeah we can index those um, uh, those members here, and then depending on the index inside of our iteration space, we can do some calculations. Um, so here are a few examples of uh, the languages that uh, came around. So just as a reference, this is GLSL on the left side. So you can see it's, it's pretty obviously derived from C, but it's also very different. Uh, for example, we have the in keyword here. And this is simply because GLSL doesn't even have any pointers. You can't take the address of any variable. Um, and this is, on, this is most likely not going to compile to a function. It's a very, very, very limited language. Um, so you can't really do any, any smart stuff in there. Um, OpenMP gained uh, the ability to, uh, to offload things on a GPU around five or six years ago with the offload um, functions. So if you want to write OpenMP code, um, the big difference is that everything stays C++ and you stay in the same, in the same source code. Uh, however, you add these paragraphs here to your code. So this is a single source uh, parallel programming model. Uh, you don't write in a separate language, in a separate file for your specialized code. Everything, everything stays in the same code. However, you still have this DSL that can get quite complicated. And especially if you start adding C++ constructs like templates, this gets messy extremely fast. Um, so OpenMP works really great for procedural languages, for stuff like C++, not really. Um, this is OpenGLC, OpenGLC on the left side. So it's much closer to C. We have pointers here. However, we need to declare the address space um, of our pointers because the, address, uh, the access patterns are different, uh, whether we are using global or local memory. Also, we need to uh, define our entry point. So that's basically saying, uh, this is my main function, um, and yeah. Then we can just operate with our pointers, do some calculations, write data, uh, write data back to the buffers, or read from the buffers, and so on. Uh, what I'm leaving out here is all the boilerplate to actually run this code, because it is still not C++. It's in a, this is a separate language. CUDA here um, is a language extension. So this is, again, in C++. Uh, this is, again, in, in the side of the C++ code. Uh, code base. However, you need to add those keywords here. So underscore underscore global, there's also underscore underscore device, underscore underscore host. Um, and you launch your kernels on a GPU with the triple angle, uh, with triple angle brackets. Um, which means that you can't compile this code with a regular C++ compiler. So this is kind of bad if you already have an existing code base where it has a lot of generic programming, for example. So what we did instead here is we created uh, SQL, which is um, a cross-platform um, programming model for standard C++. Uh, so our goal was that we don't add any new language features. We in, instead, we try to remove the language features where they don't make sense. Like on a GPU, you don't really want to have virtual functions or exceptions or something like that because, well, if you have a big and wide SEMD unit, how do you make a virtual call happen? This doesn't really map to a GPU really well. If you can, you can emulate it, but it will be very slow. Um, so yeah, the reasons why why we're using uh, why we're creating SQL, um, we. Uh, yeah, standard C++, as I said. And uh, we, uh, another important thing is um, in OpenCL, uh, 
you need to copy your data explicitly. Like, like, like I just said, if we want to move our data from a CPU to the GPU, uh, we need to say this explicitly in our C code. And with SQL, we abstract that all away and let the runtime handle that. So instead, we just declare our dependencies between our uh, kernels and pieces of execution, and the runtime will just figure out the dependency graph. Um, we, we, so we do this uh, using the buffer and accessor classes. So with buffers, you're giving away ownership of a piece of memory to the runtime, saying this piece of memory is going to be used by some computational task. And with the accessors, you're registering you know, the kernels that you like to execute with the buffers. So they are the glue between your actual, um, your actual data and the thing that, oper that operates on the data. Um, using the accessors, you can also state where your data is actually going to land because you can have different kind of accessors. With the host buffer accessors, your data stays on the CPU. With the global buffer and uh, the local accessors, you can control the locality explicitly inside of your program. It's also the constant buffer, which has some performance optimizations because the data can never be written to on the GPU. But yeah. So here's an example. We have four buffers, A, B, C, D. And we have three kernels, A, B, C. The first kernel reads from the first buffer and it writes to the second buffer. The second kernel writes to the, uh, reads from the first buffer and writes to the third buffer. And the third kernel reads from the first two buffers and writes to the last buffer. This is extremely messy to synchronize in a C code base where you have callbacks at best. But since we use accessors and their accessors do all the realization stuff for you, um, this will end up being a dependency graph like that, and the dependency graph gives us, the, gives us enough information to schedule the kernels properly, do all the um, data transfers in time, do all the synchronization stuff. So yeah, the benefits are obvious. We can be much more declarative about what we actually want to compute, and the runtime may even be able to do some optimizations. Um, so saying, okay, we're going to need the data soon, let's copy it because we have time right. So here's an actual example in SQL. Um, so first of all, I'm starting with CL SQL because, well, I don't want to type that much. Now I'm creating um, a name for every one of my kernels. So that's a thing that we have in, in SQL that every piece of, uh, so every kernel needs to have um, a globally visible name. Uh, so a name is just basically a type. So uh, our, the runtime can later specialize on the type of the kernel, basically. Um, then here's my function declaration. Here's my sexpy function. Um, so sexpy is basically just I have a scalar value. I have two vectors. And then I do scalar times vector plus vector. Uh, so here's my scalar. Here are my two vectors. Here's the length of my two vectors. And then I pass a Q, which takes a Q, uh, which takes um, computational tasks for a specific device. Then I have my buffers. With the buffers, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to need both, uh, I need the, both the first and the second vector of length n. And then I can submit my, um, uh, my computation here. And I do this by passing a lambda that receives a command group handler. And using this command group handler, I can connect the accessor the, uh, that I create here with my actual queue here and my execution, uh, well, and my parallel four or the kernel here. So here I'm saying, I'm only reading from the first buffer, so give me read-only access. Here I'm saying, okay, I need to write to this buffer, I need read-write access. So the, comp the open seal implementation is likely to be able to do some optimizations based on the kind of access patterns you define here. And then, you can, do, you can launch a parallel 4 from 0 to n with a uh, one-dimensional uh, index space. And for each item inside of your index space, we get um, our index here, and then we do our computation and just write to the read-write accessor here. Is everything clear, so OK. So once we have this. Uh, piece of code, we need to compile it. So usually you just have your C++ compiler, you get object code, you get 
um, you pipe it through a linker, you get an executable. Uh, with SQL, it's very similar, except that you have two compilers. So you have your CPU compiler that can be any compiler like, since it's standard C++. Um, so yeah, right, what I forgot to mention here. Um, these pointers here, as you can see, they don't have any address space attached. What we do here is that we deduce the address space um, based on how we use these functions here. So if I ever do a function call in here, I don't need to add any address spaces here. We just infer them from the um, surrounding code. So it's basically an additional set of type deduction rules. So yeah, this is why our code stays standard C++. And yeah, we have our CPU compiler that can compile our code like, like it always has. We get CPU code, uh, object code. Uh, we get a pipe through a link here. We get an executable. At the same time, we compile the same thing with the device compiler. The device compiler extracts all the kernels that we just defined. And for each of those kernels, creates specialized device object code. Um, also passes it into the linker, and together with the SQL runtime, we get an executable that can launch both uh, tasks on the CPU and on the GPU. So this is also a very neat feature that we can uh, that uh, that we enable here. That uh, we can yes. No, the CPU co uh, compiler sees everything. It compiles everything. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the question was, um, um, does the compiler, the CPU compiler omit the uh, device code? So my answer was, yeah, no, it does not. It compiles everything. So what was the question now? No, no. Um, so the, the generated code is of use, the generated CPU code is of use because um, what you can, for example, do is you say at runtime, I don't want to run on the GPU because I made a mistake. I have a bug somewhere. I want to debug it. So uh, who were the FPGA guys again? Um, right. How do you debug your Verilog code, for example? If you compile your code with SQL, for example, you are able to recompile everything for your CPU or a GPU and run your debugger for this device where we have much better tools available. So this would be a use case for that. Um, so yeah. Um, Uh, so what, what, what you're saying, um, yes, both compilers compile everything. No, 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 the, the, the CPU compiler can compile everything. The device compiler has actually not compile everything. And that's, uh, I'll explain later why. Um, actually, I, I would just want to show you a Godbolt example. Um, so yeah, here's SexPy in Godbolt. Um, yeah, so, here I have GCC 8.1, which compiles everything, as you can see. You can see the colors here. It compiles our kernel here. Uh, and then it, it, this is just the regular boilerplate that always uh, comes up. Um, however, I also have my uh, device compiler installed. Um, right. So here's GCC. Here is our compiler here. Um, and if I enable the device compilation here, you can see that it generated a kernel here. Here it does the load of the first pointer, the multiplication, uh, yeah, the multiplication with the scalar, the load with the second point, uh, vector, and then does the addition, and then it does a store. So this is just this single piece of code compiled for the GPU. And the reason we have to do this like that, that we only look at the used functions is, well, what if you hash include IO stream into your, into your code? We can't compile IO stream for the GPU, it doesn't make sense. Uh, because we have virtual function, we have exceptions, it, yeah, it, will, it would blow up. Um, so this is why we selectively look at the things we actually need for the GPU and then compile like that. Yes. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, the question was that, do we only compile the things uh, that uh, are actually visible to the GPU kernel? Yeah, so that's exactly what we do. Um, as I said, again, because yeah, we, we can't do it other, otherwise, also it would probably be a slight performance improvement. And then the next thing is, you probably get a, uh, get a combinatorial explosion if you don't do this. For example, well, if you have a function that takes a pointer uh, and you don't do this analysis of which function they actually need, you need to compile out of every, fun uh, for every pointer, you need to compile three different overloads, or four different overloads, because we have different address spaces. Uh, this, so yeah, this also requires the uh, definition to be available for every function you call, yeah. If this was also you. But yeah. Um, I just talked about device code. What we just saw here, this is some kind of LVM art thing, uh, right? So there is no real GPU machine code. So there, there are way too many GPU architectures around. Um, we can't compile for every single one of those. What we do instead is we compile to a portable intermediate representation first. Uh, and the Kronos group defines two of those, the first one being Spear and the other one being Spear V. Spear is what you just saw, it's a fork of LLVM. Spear V uh, is basically the successor of Spear and is not a fork of LLVM but a separate thing simply because they realize that it's a bad idea to force GPU driver vendors to embed an, an, an entire compiler inside of an entire LLVM compiler that is outdated even inside of the driver. Um, so yeah, uh, we only submit IR and then we did compile uh, this code at runtime once we launch our executable and submit the code to the GPU. So we're in an interesting spot where we have C++ code but we did compile it. This gives us some very interesting things to play with. Um, uh, for example, well, I don't really need to do extreme TMP. I could just create measures of, of injecting um, um, immediate values that are only visible for, to the JIT runtime. Um, so this is a, an active topic of research that, we, that we're working on. Um, just uh, doing, uh, working more with the JIT compiler itself instead of assuming that, well, it's recompiled to the machine code straight out. Um, so since Sickle is uh, not really a language extension, but a way of implementing heterogeneous programming with existing code, uh, we can do a lot of interesting things when it comes to the C++ standardization. For example, um, yeah, so first of all, the C++ direction group already um, noted that uh, we need better support for heterogeneous in, uh, programming and concurrency in C++ because we're trying to get, uh, get access to the, all the hardware that we have available and we currently just can't with standard C++. So Sickle in the end is still just an API in addition to C++. Um, so, uh, one of the things that was solve this problem, or at least um, make it less severe, would be executors. So executors are um, a generic um, way of submitting execution to an arbitrary execution device. That can be something like, um, I want to create a, a network handler for my server. I want to have threat pools from a parallel STL. Or I just want to offload this piece of uh, code to a specialized accelerator. Um, so that's something that we would really like to have had in CBUS 20. It's probably not going to be in CBUS 20, it will probably be in 23. Uh, I'm also not that much into executors, but uh, is Detlef here? Okay, he's probably in some other talk. But yeah, Detlef gave his talk at ACCU. Uh, if you want to know more about executors, you can probably just ask him or just watch his talk. Um, another interesting thing, parallel STL. So the parallel STL, um, as it is now, I think, in MSVC and in the experimental versions of glibc or libc++, uh, only uses the CPU. Um, however, with Sickle, we can do better. We can define our uh, a custom execution policy here, the Sickle heterogeneous policy. And with that, we compile 
everything we pipe into these functions here, like this lambda here, both for a CPU and the GPU, and then we just distribute all the work. And suddenly we gain access to both the GPU and the CPU and can, can leverage the entire processor for your um, computational needs if you do, do need to do a lot of number crunching. And what we, you obviously need to make sure that it's, it's worth it, that you can map your problem, problem well to your GPU, but now you can actually do it with a more standard C++ fashion. Um, have it, there's a small problem here. Um, does anyone know the, the common criticism of STL? Right. What's wrong with STL? Uh, how do you, would you like to? Yes, the STL is not composable. Um, and here it gets more of a problem because we don't, we have to create barriers here between our, uh, between our calls to the parallel STL function because we might have to deal with pointer aliasing, right? So uh, we upload things here, then we, we, then we copy data back to the CPU even though we're never going to need it, we're just calling the next kernel. There's a lot of synchronization going on here that we don't actually need. And if we just had, could just compose our kernels into a single one, we don't have this problem anymore. So last year, we um, submitted a very exploratory paper to the committee, Peril Ranges, uh, that uh, is exactly this. So uh, here is SaxPy again, now implemented with the Ranges TS, or in this case, Range Re 3. Um, and yeah, we just compose our algorithm, and then we have a single transform function here, and uh, we submit our data once, we do our uh, fuse together, we uh, launch our fuse together kernel on the GPU, get the data back, um, much less synchronization overhead. Uh, so this is something where the standard C++ side really shines because if we would need to be, uh, if you would need to um, add all the annotations that we would have to add in say OpenMP or CUDA, you would never be able to do this because we would in this case, we used um, range Free 3 for our reference implementation. We would need to add these annotations everywhere. Uh, so this would be a huge task, with, uh, whereas with SQL, we can just embed all the TMP code we, we, we want. It's already there. It's standard C++. We just paste it in. It works. So all we need to do is basically we just add a small piece of support code here. And yeah, we could just use range Free 3 on the GPU. So here's an, another example um, where we use this, uh, this uh, technique um, of fusing kernels together to gain better performance or just better maintainability because we could keep our code separate and still be performant because we could just fuse it together with the templates. And we did exactly this um, technique for our implementation of the BLAST libraries where we create an expression tree with templates at compile time and fuse it together to create an optimized kernel. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, here's the paper, here's the QR code. If you're interested, you can, yeah, you can read it. Um, so this allows us to um, do TensorFlow on uh, SQL and OpenCL, for example, because TensorFlow uh, requires optimized BLAST libraries and convolution libraries to, um, lo uh, to be able to run efficiently on accelerator hardware. Uh, and with uh, uh, with SQL Blast and DNN, we have the libraries for uh, optimized computation. Uh, before that, um, you, it, TensorFlow would usually fall back to Eigen, for example, or just fall back to the CPU. Um, and this is also um, the reason that, well, TensorFlow, uh, the, uh, if you want to run TensorFlow today on some kind of arbitrary OpenCL device, you are going to need SQL because there were previous attempts and they pretty much all failed because converting everything from the C++ code they already have to the to OpenCLC and re-implementing everything is just not maintainable. Just the task is too big. Um, yeah. So this brings me to the SQL ecosystem. Um, so are there any ranches using here by any chance? This is Arca. No one? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, if you happen to have a Renaissance Arca HV board, um, 
we already provide them with an implementation of OpenCL and Sickle and uh, therefore also TensorFlow on their uh, special image processor. Um, we have binary packages for Yecto Linux. Um, you can just go to our website and download it and try it out. Um, if you ever want to work on autonomous driving, for example, uh, this would be an, an alternative to all the more, uh, to the other proprietary um, ways of enabling um, machine learning on embedded hardware. So Sickle is an open standard, right? Um, you can just later on switch out our implementation with something else that um, that is open source. Um, speaking of implementations, uh, we are not the only one. So we're the only conf officially conformant one. Um, however, there are also three different uh, implementations that I'm aware of. There is uh, Hipsicle, which is, I think, a research project by a PhD student. And it works on top of AMD's HIP instead of OpenCL. AMD's HIP is basically uh, AMD copied uh, the CUDA API um, for easy portability. Um, and he implemented Sickle on top of that, and yeah, instead of OpenCL, so this doesn't require an OpenCL uh, driver to be installed. And he's able to run on AMD, current gen AMD hardware, and on NVIDIA hardware, in addition to the host execution. Uh, there's also Tricycle, which is driven by Xilinx. And uh, this is also open source. And the interesting thing about this implementation is that it is um, allegedly able to run on Xilinx FPGAs. So if you ever want to run modern C++ on an FPGA, you should probably try out Tricycle. However, I haven't tried it out yet, so your mileage may vary. And what also happened a couple of years back, uh, a couple of years, a couple of weeks back, is that Intel announced that they also want to um, um, support Sickle and want to add it to LLVM and Clang. So in the future, it might just be your system Clang that might to do all uh, might be able to do all the stuff and maybe offload to um, all the targets that Nvidia that Clang already supports, like Nvidia and AMD and possibly other targets. Um, we got libraries. There's an old TensorFlow. Um, we also have a custom. We have also added a Sickle to Eigen, and it's almost fully upstreamed. Uh, they, we, I think we're just waiting for the maintainer to hit the merge button. So then, uh, in a in a short while, it will probably just be just use Eigen and support Sickle. Uh, as I said, we have the parallel SDL. We have a computer vision library called Vision CPP. Um, we also have to have different performance primitives for different tasks, like Sickle DNN um, for convolution, Sickle ML for more classical uh, machine learning algorithms like um, PCAs, and Sickle Blast for all your mathematical primitives. If you want to learn more, um, you can check out our Sickle guide uh, on developer.coplay.com. We have both an introductory SQL guide and a guide that is specifully geared towards CUDA developers. So if you have already used CUDA, you probably want to take a look at that. Um, I've also started working on this thing called SQL reference, um, which is basically CPP reference, but for the SQL classes. Um, it's very much work in progress because I still need to patch the documentation generator. It's all automatically generated, but it is, in my opinion, already more accessible than the specification you can also read. Um, and if you just want to read more news about SQL in general, you can go to SQL.tech, which is just, yeah, well, a few links to blog posts and so on. So, yeah, that's about it. Um,